All right. Welcome back, everyone. Not everyone yet, because we don't have any viewers quite yet, but uh, I'm sure we will in a minute. But welcome back to another episode of Chef Life Live. Uh, I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday, wonderful New Year. We weren't on last week. I want to give everyone a nice break through the new year uh, of everyone seeing, you know, 2021 is starting off just as crazy as 2020 ended, but hopefully we get into some better times. But like I said, this is Chef Life Live. I am your host, Chef Alex Otouche, and I'm here. We interview chefs and other people in the food service industry to get a more in-depth look of what this world is really like. I am very happy to have Chef Jimmy Papadopoulos on with us tonight. Chef Jimmy Papadopoulos, <laughs> Papadopoulos' passion for his work has always revolved around two driving forces, people and food. A fascination with the art style and technique of great cooking as well as the opportunity to enrich the lives of others over the dinner table has been his inspiration since the beginning of his career. He describes his cooking as bright, bold, and beautiful and pushes himself to showcase the soulful, rich techniques that exemplify exceptional cooking and genuine hospitality. A strong believer that greatness comes from the sum of a collective team effort he works to create an environment where his staff have the ability to evolve their techniques while working with some of the highest quality mish, meat, fish, vegetables, and grains from around the world. In 2015, he was named Eater Chicago's Chef of the Year, as well as one of Zagat's 30 Under 30. After opening Bohemian House as executive chef, he partnered with Boca Restaurant Group in 2017 to open Belmore, an American brasserie in Chicago's West Loop. Since opening Belmore, the restaurant has been awarded the number one spot on Rob Report's new best new restaurants in America, and he himself was named one of Rob Report's 2018's best young chefs in the country. So he's an amazing chef. He's got a lot to offer. His food is great. I've been to Belmore before. I got to stage and work with him a little bit, and it was incredible. So I'm going to bring him on, and kind of we will get to know him just a little bit better. Hey, chef. Alex, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. I know you're, I know you're a busy guy. You got a lot going on. So I appreciate you taking the time to uh, come talk to us. So I know I kind of gave a gave you a pretty good introduction there, but is there anything else you want to tell us about yourself before we kind of get into the... Uh, I think you nailed it. Uh, I always tell people I'm, I'm just a dude cooking food. That's it. You know, just... just something I love to do and it's my it happens to be my passion my career and, and all the other stuff so all right awesome well then we can kind of just get right to it well first off you know how was how was your holidays Christmas and New Year's and all that it's it's been awesome uh you know with everything uh that's going on in the world I think this this, this year has really challenged uh, many people um in a lot of ways and one thing that it's, it's really given me I look at the silver lining is the time with my family has been uh you can't put a you can't put a price on that so to, yeah. with everything going on and all the shit and all the, the frustration and anxiety of the world, it's kind of nice to just learn that it get, get comfortable being uncomfortable and, and enjoy yeah. what you got while you got it. Because right now that's, that's the best thing. And, and the kids are, are at home doing e-learning and I'm, I, I've had so much time with, with them. We've eaten dinner every single night together as a family, which is such a rare thing in this profession. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's really been just honestly as shitty as it is, it's, it's been a beautiful time for me personally. And I've kind of just tried to disconnect and just, disconnect from the world and plug in with my family and really, really make some the most of this time. So. Yeah, that's great. I know I've kind of tell people whenever I tell people, Oh, I was, you know, I kind of like lost my job back in March and they're like, Oh, I'm so sorry. It's like, well, you know, it's, it does stink, but it's been kind of nice. Been spending spend a lot more time at home with my fiance right. Julie and everything. And so it's been, you know, there's, there's has been some pros to it, but you know, obviously some negatives as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. As, as we're all experiencing. But uh, are, are you originally from the Chicago area? I've been, I've been, so I've been born and raised in Downers Grove. I've been living here my whole life. I still live here with my wife and three kids. Um, it's just, it feels like home. I went to high school here. Um, you know, I've, I've just never really left. It's kind of like a place where I, my roots are, you know, I just feel, it feels like home. Yeah, for sure. How was the, the food scene like while you were growing up? How is it different from like it is now? It's, I mean, you know, where I live in Downers, it's a really small community. There's not a lot of really progressive restaurants that are kind of breaking ground or things like that. Um, yeah. It, it's, de it's definitely a place that has so much potential as a community. And it, it's, you know, it, it, I think that a as different operators come into town and things might change in the suburbs. And I feel that with everything going on and everybody's getting really simplistic with lifestyle with all this shit, you know, everyone's kind of just trying to slow down and 
you have a lot of people moving out of the city and moving to the suburbs and all this stuff. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, uh, like I said, it's a small community, but it's a place that, that I feel is home. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. But do you have some like other favorite food cities other than Chicago that you really love visiting? Like specifically. For oh food? yeah. Heck yeah. I mean, I think Chicago is almost second to none. I mean, well, New York's pretty freaking amazing. Um, so That's sorry to say that. Yeah, it's, it's it's really close. I think they're so they're they're so different in so many ways, and they're also so unique in their own ways. Um, mm-hmm. Chicago's amazing, but outside of that, I was at in Portland in 2012 with my wife. So it's been about eight years since I've been to Portland, um, and I just remember we went there and we literally spent four days and we ate every single day like breakfast, mid lunch, lunch, mid dinner. Like it was just amazing. <laughs> we went to um, Ox, which was like this, this amazing like wood fired grill that they had there, and it was like all just very Argentinian, but like with a lot of like modern new American uh, touches. We ate a pock pock. We, we went to the Fifth Street food carts. And I just remember that whole uh, trip was nothing but eating and drinking. And the city, we fell in love with it. I mean, it was such a cool little town. Um, it is quaint feeling. You know, was, we went to the Park City Grill, which is like the iconic way up at the top, their tallest building in town. And it's like this gorgeous view that just overlooks the city and stuff. And we went to Deschutes Brewery and hung out. And it, it was just such a great trip and a fun uh, food city. So I think Portland is definitely on my list. We were in San Francisco about three years ago, which I also felt was amazing. I had, you know, we ate at Bennu and that, that was, uh, you know, a total high end, uh, you know, you know, three Michelin star experience, but it was a fucking amazing, 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 amazing restaurant. Probably one of my yeah. top three meals of my life. Um, nice. and San, San Fran was awesome too. I mean, we were, we cruised down, we did Swan Oyster Depot, we got there at 10 in the morning and we were the first two people, or we got there like before 10, like nine or whatever. We were the first two people in line and uh, they were filming the best thing I ever ate for uh, Food Network. Oh, wow. And ironically, so cool. we had to sign. We were actually on one of the episodes. Uh, no, my, old wow. sous chef, my old sous chef, Chris uh, Schwellenbach, he, like out of the blue, like a year ago, he's like, he's like, dude, I'm watching uh, Best Thing I Ever Ate. And all of a sudden, uh, I see you and Ashley sitting at the bar and like they interviewed you. It's like, yeah, we were, we went, we, we like crushed like a 10 a.m. seafood like breakfast. We're like, <laughs> it was like $300. We got like dungeon and crap, like everything. We like just, just murdered the menu for lunch. It wasn't even lunch, it was like yeah. 10 a.m. But, but we ended up on the TV show and it was just a, a fun trip. That's here. awesome. Stanford, That's so cool. Yeah, San Fran was pretty rad. Um, you know, I, I haven't really been out lately, obviously, you know, with all this stuff oh, going right, on. Yeah. yeah. And the, the past year and a half of work has been, you know, different. So, it's, you know, we made a couple of trips to New York here and there. But mm-hmm. my two tops, I would say, just for my experience, I think Portland is up there as one of the coolest. And, you know, San Fran was pretty rad, too. Yeah. I saw, I actually, have, I've never been to New York, Portland, or San Fran, unfortunately. I need to go to New York there. first. Yeah. I go, get, you got to get, yeah. I've, I've never been to New York. And, and when I got there, um, it was actually right around the time we were opening Belmore. I was, I went to do some desk side, uh, chats with a couple of food writers or whatever about the restaurant and yeah. um i remember getting off in manhattan and like instantly like getting like this like big city anxiety like like you realize how small <laughs> you are and how freaking busy yeah. the city is and it's like i was by myself and i was zipping around the city all day in cabs from here to here to here and like it was it was it was one hell of a trip but the food i mean uh, lee wolin got me to uh, into emp and i got to sit at the bar and they treated me like freaking royalty because because of him and his connection with EMP and, and yeah. Chef Home. And it was, it was just, awesome. you know, it was a magical trip for sure. Very, very awesome. Such a cool food city. Yeah, I believe it for sure. I mean, I've, obviously I've known New York is one of the top, but I just have, yeah. I'll get there eventually. My fiance, Julie, yeah. is on the East Coast, so I, I know we'll end up going there, but. Uh, it's it's, it's the Mecca, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So Julie want, wanted to know if, uh, when you travel, is it just you and the missus or do you travel with the kids as well? So we go out with the kids and we do the family trips. We'll go to like Wisconsin Lake House and we do that every year with our entire family. So her sisters and her parents and all of us, there's like 16, 17 of us in a house and on the lake. And it's like those kinds of trips are like those lifelong memories of all the kids playing and boating and fishing and all that stuff. Um, you know, with everything going on, our kids are at that age where they're eight, six and five. So they're the perfect age to start going places. So we've had yeah. Disney World planned for two years. Uh, oh, two years oh. ago, it was the it was the hurricane, and that was a, it, it canceled Disney trip, so we didn't get to go to Disney yeah. with them. And then this year, we were supposed to go in September again, and we had COVID, and it was like we don't want to go to Disney World with masks and experience, you know, for their first time to yeah. experience Disney World like that would just be, it, you know, it takes away from the, the the magic of Disney World. So right, yeah, um, definitely would. 
we hope like two things for us, like our, what my wife and I, Ashley, we always talk about like how, how much we'd love to be able to just, just go experience this country with our kids and like go do things and go to the East coast and travel all the way to the East coast and just eat at some amazing seafood shacks and see the Pacific Northwest together and, and those kinds of life experiences. I think that, uh, obviously in our career, you don't really get a lot of time for that. And then also the money that correlates with doing big trips for big families is, uh, yeah, a little much, sure. but, so yeah, we, we, sometimes it's just, you know, if it's, if I'm traveling for work or if it's me and my wife, they get to go out, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's definitely tough when you, you know, as chefs, we want to go and try all the food all over the world, but that comes with a price tag. And unfortunately right. we didn't pick the most lucrative <laughs> careers. So <laughs> yeah. Someone says if you, if you want to make money, you're in the wrong industry. So yes, that is absolutely true. Um, um, well, what about Chicago though? Like, or what are your like go-to hotspot eateries for just in Chicago? I, I so for me, it's it's still uh, you know one of my favorite restaurants uh, of all time was 2008 era, 2008 2010, right when the Publican opened. I think they you know there's no no question, and that restaurant was so fucking special. Uh, it it meant so much to that neighborhood. Uh, to the city and i think that you know there's there's no question it was a magical place i still remember my first meal there like it was yesterday i remember pulling up and the rain was falling and we got a parking spot right out front and you know it was still when it was they were the only restaurant over there there was no and there's yeah. isaac's fish place right across the street you go there and, and you'd see freaking trucks with pigs hanging in them it was just a different different time for that neighborhood and and uh yeah i remember pulling up in front and sitting down and and we're sitting right by the front and the rain was falling and the sun was kissing through the rain it was like this romantic my wife and i in 2008 or 9 and uh we had their pork belly with like cream corn um pickled grilled peppers and swiss chard and the the server's name was joseph escobar he paired it with the duchess de Borgonia, the uh, sour flemish red ale and like it was just like this you, I never put beer and food together like that. And the food was so soulful yeah. and so delicious and straightforward, but everything just hammered and fired on all cylinders. And it was just so, so damn delicious and such a cool vibe. So I'm gushing yeah, about them, really you know, but I, I think everyone knows how amazing, you know, publican is. Um, it, 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 I think that when you dine, especially in a big city, there's so many different experiences to experience of what restaurants have to offer. So when I, when I think of really special, um, events obviously smith is always on my list you know it's the, it's the top of the list for me i think um his john's creativity execution vibe they just nail it I, you know that place is special and it's got that special soul that that you can't just buy and hang up in your restaurant um so, so i think for a high-end experience and and, and and even just an experience that's just really really unique it, it's smith for sure um you know i'm trying to think of other other really casual i mean um, you know, Zaragoza, I've always wanted to try his food. I'd never, never tried it for, you know, uh, Jonathan Zaragoza, super, super awesome kid. Um, yeah. so yeah, there, there's, but there's, there's so many fucking talented people in the city you know, and there's just, everyone's just kind of, it's such a community of, of, of amazing, talented folks whom are all running very cool, fun spots. And it's, it's just really feels like a community. So Chicago, I mean, there's, it's hard to say one favorite and I'm like, I'm jumping all over the place, but yeah, I'm yeah. Say, in that kind of a realm, I think, I mean, JP Graziano, if you want to go get a sub, I think, you know, Bari's got great subs too, but I love going to see Jimmy at JP Graziano. There's just a fucking awesome city. So there's just too many. Yeah. <laughs> too many choices. Too many choices. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, Julie had another question. Is your wife a chef as well or just you? Uh, my wife is a phenomenal chef uh, for our kids and for me when she's cooking. So she's super okay. good. Uh, she, she's actually a teacher by trade. So she's a uh, a preschool teacher. Um, okay. And so our, our schedule raising our, you know, raising when we started her family was always kind of, we were so opposite. You know, I worked kind of nights and Ashley would work the morning. So our schedules were so different. And then as our mm -hmm. family started, started to grow, um, you know, it just made more sense financially and also for her to stay home and be with the children and raise them while I was working so much um okay. so so yeah she she definitely loves cooking she loves having me home for this time too because we literally do breakfast lunch and dinner together as a family and it's it's uh it's yeah. given her a big break of all the cooking for the kids and and all that stuff so yeah i'm sure she's probably like all right now i know this is like not you working but get to work let's go get in the kitchen <laughs> chef let's yeah. go she's she's super <laughs> into it and she's like i'm gonna be so sad when you go back to work because i'm gonna have to cook again so <laughs> Not because she's gonna miss you, just because she's gonna have to cook again. Yeah, not that. Yeah, not missing me. She'll miss <laughs> having, you know, having food and 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 not taking care of. So, yeah, that's real. <laughs> that's funny. 
Uh, so yeah, obviously there's like so many different like cookbooks and resources out there now for chefs with YouTube videos and just everything at someone's fingertips for knowledge. But like, do you have any specific resources that you, that really helped you when you were learning like either books or, or yeah, you know, yeah, totally. Or I, I, I'm very, uh, from a school of like, you know, you got to teach yourself how to learn and you have to really kind of immerse yourself into things. I think that, you know, everyone says, oh, you talent. And I feel when you become obsessed with something, your talent will kind of be cultivated, right? And and for me, mm -hmm. cooking was was a big piece of that. Like, I, I, it's very visceral. You know, cooking is, is all instinct and gut. And then it's also yeah. experience and process and learning the systems and the basics of, of how to make food taste good. Um, but mm -hmm. from there, I, I think inspiration and also education resources today, so... I mean, it it just doesn't stop. I mean, you turn on your phone, you get you can get bombarded with anything. If you're into fucking brakes, different types of brakes for your mountain bike, you can get inundated with you know. There's just so much resources on the internet for anything you're into, yeah. especially with cooking now. It's you know, it's one of the biggest food source, biggest thing that brings people together is food, right? We all have to do yeah, it. We all have different cultures. We all have food from around mm -hmm. the world, and 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 food is such a you know massive, massive, uh, massive thing. So for me, for resources today. Um, it's more about products now for me. I, I get inspired by things that I, I work with and see because I've kind of already built an acumen and I understand fundamentals. And, but when mm -hmm. I was growing up, you know, and, and I knew I wanted to become a chef, um, cookbooks. I mean, it was like I, the French Laundry was the very first book I ever read and really started realizing I taught myself how to cook out of that book front to back. And yeah. I, I was 20, 22 years old or, or something at the time. And I went to a place called uh, Chicago Game and Gourmet and bought a lobe of foie gras. And I did uh, Thomas Keller's Torchon in my mom's kitchen at her townhouse, like literally oh, wow. step by step by step, the, four, the whole four day process just to learn and, you know, yeah. and, and fuck it up and not make a good Torchon and learn. And, and I think that, you know, part of it is the desire to learn and then you just find inspiration. And, and obviously you want to look to credible sources for your learning. So for me, it's, it's cookbooks. And when I was younger, I used to pick up magazines at grocery stores and the internet, the internet wasn't as big um, as it right. is back then. You, you didn't have so much at your fingertips like you do now. Mm -hmm. I mean, now you, you could find, you could follow David Kinch or you could follow the, this guy in Europe who's, it, it, it's just, it's just, it's so, so much easier to market yourself and really kind of learn and find education these days because of, you know, technology. Yeah. I mean, we're sitting here right now right. in two different rooms talking and it's like, that's, that, right. that's what the world is coming. So Yeah. Live on the internet too. It's not even just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's not pre-recorded. Well, yeah, but then there's there's eight people watching right now, you know, watching us talk. So thank you That's to our perfect. eight viewers out there. I really yes, appreciate thank it. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, the French Laundry Cookbook is great. Anything by Thomas Keller. I personally have been going through his the Bouchon Bakery Cookbook because that's something, uh, baking is something I like lack as far as the talent. So I'm trying to get better mm -hmm. at it. and just trying to find, there's this one chocolate cake I've been trying to perfect and I've done it twice now, it's getting better, but just trying to follow like step by steps and have the techniques right. and everything. Like that. But it, yeah, it, for sure. It, I, I literally, I mean, you could learn so many ways. You could learn from a grandma, you could learn from your mom, you could learn from, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that's the most beautiful thing about this craft in this industry is that everybody yeah. has, it's like, it's almost like DNA. Everybody has their own language with food, right? And how to cook and, and you can learn from, from a you can learn an amazing technique but you, you might have not ever been privy to because of, it's just not a part of your cooking style, what you've seen. So, you know, exposure. Yeah, for sure. So with working in kitchens, I've worked in both. I've worked in like fine dining. I've worked in very casual. And I've something I've noticed is the trend of like music or not music or like silent, yeah. silent kitchen versus like <laughs> sure, uh, sure. more noisy kitchen. Like what do you prefer in your kitchens? Yeah. You know, yeah, do you, do you think that music's kind of motivate everyone or it's like nobody talk? It, it's, super, it's, it's super for me. It's super um, indicative of what we're doing, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. in the early days of Belmore, like when we first opened, you know, it was a very posh restaurant. It was high end. It was fine dining. You know, it was very expensive to go eat there. And, and you know, it was very in that kind of a, a setting of, of the millions of variables that need to happen to get one service together. There's an immense amount of focus that was required and an immense, immense amount of detail. And, and, uh, and that mm -hmm. doesn't just happen from one person. That's the coordination of an entire team. So at that, in those days, it was much more like, you know, very yes chef, no chef. We're just focusing on the work, getting our tasks done. So no music was really a part of the, the restaurant at that time. Um, yeah. And ultimately, too, I, th I think it really it's really indicative of what you're cooking. You know, like for me, it's like music. 
Um, when I cook at home, I, I've got my music playing because I love it. It, it, it just makes yeah. me feel comfortable. It, it's like I like relaxed music when I'm cooking at my house. Um, but then yeah. if I'm like, you know, when I used to run Bohemian House, I mean, you'd walk in the basement and Wu-Tang would be playing or the, you know, the guys, the, the prep team would be playing some amazing music. It just like we, we kind of it was a different vibe. So it was much more. It kind of set the pace and the tone for the day. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I think music is is such a you know an amazing art form it really is something that makes you feel you know genuinely yeah. you know through, through the through the sense of sound you feel so i think that you know what you're listening to is kind of very important for for what's going on and you know if, you, if you're if you're you know blasting some black metal from norwegian black metal in the middle of service some people they they get down with that and they want to you know bang with it i i, I don't yeah. I don't particularly like really intense music when I'm cooking because it doesn't yeah. doesn't correlate to my focus and, and what I'm trying to execute with the food. Yeah. So, um. for sure, yeah, it definitely depends. For me, for me, I listen like at home when I cook. Like lately, I've been doing like podcasts. I just listen to podcasts now, but before I was doing like instrumental stuff. I, for a while, I was doing like uh, instrumental, like heavy metal. So like no words or yeah. anything, just like freaking crazy, yeah, sure. yeah, like ripping double and going sure. and. It just right. kind of got me in the groove, but I love it. Right. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I'm so, listening, like for one thing, I love to listen to is like if I'm I'm in the kitchen, I'll like Zach Brown band, like something like fun country. I don't like anything that's yeah. on, like it just feels like it's good, good time music. Like that that that's my kind of cooking music, you know, just good vibes. Yeah, for sure, definitely. I feel you there. All right, so now that we've gotten to know you just a little bit more, just a couple lighter questions. It's time to jump into everyone's favorite section of questions, which of course require no garnish. All right, so, well, first off, how do you feel about actually being interviewed? Like some people don't really like to talk about themselves that much. And I know this isn't really like mainstream or anything, you know, like a few viewers and everything, but like, how do, how do you feel about actually just being interviewed about your craft? I love it. I mean, I think to me, it's it, some people are very, you know, I look at it like a conversation, right? That's all it is. We're, we're just two people talking about something that we love. So it should come naturally. So I enjoy it as long as it's, it's, it's in the right theme and it makes sense. And it's, it's, you know, like, don't ask me who my favorite football team is or any of that crap because I'm not really a sports guy. But, you know, it's, if it's about things that I'm excited about and into, I, I love being interviewed and I love discussing it. I think connecting with people about your craft is half of what makes it so enjoyable, right? So, Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Well, how, how did you become a professional chef then? Like when, when in your journey as far as like professional oh, yeah. cooking? <laughs> this is, uh, so for me, cooking is, it's funny how I kind of ended up doing this. Um, I grew up very artistic, you know, for me, it was always drawing and I was always kind of a very creative mind. Um, I wasn't really the best of kids. I, I dropped out of high school. Uh, I got a DUI when I was like 19. I, I was a, kind of a fuck up. My mom was the only child. Uh, my mom was an only mother uh, with three children and she was a hairstylist. So she did, she worked her ass off to provide for us. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I dropped out of high school um, with like a, a 0.8 GPA. I fucking hated school. Like school just wasn't for me. I, yeah. I, I despised it. It didn't, I couldn't connect it. I just didn't, I had to do kinesthetic things. And I, I was working when I was 15 years old, my mom uh, was cutting hair for uh, some guy who owned a pizza place in Woodridge, which I still eat pizza from to this day. It's, it's amazing tavern style pizza, Papa's pizza in Woodridge. If, if any of you guys are in the area, awesome. Any of our eight viewers are, are around, they could check it out. Um, but I, I started out working there. My mom said, you know, go see Mark. He'll give you a job, uh, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I literally, we lived like within, Five, five minute walk from the pizza place. So I went there and they hired me as a dishwasher. All right, I was 15 years old, it was my first job ever. And I went there and I, uh, I, I fell in love with the work so quickly because it was very fast, it was very intense. Everybody in the kitchen was kind of like a band of pi pirates. You know, there was a hotline, um, you know, where, where all the hotline cooks were. And then we kind of just, mm -hmm. just, you know, I was a part of something. I thought, you know, I was 15 years old and it was Jimmy, you know, come over here and punch the pizza dough. And there'd be these big like bowls of dough that would just be like rising in the back. And and my job was to go degas them. And then I would help the drivers scale them later in the night for, for all the pizzas that the pizza cook would make. And it kind yeah. of just, uh, it all started there. So that, I mean, you know, ironically yeah. working in the kitchen, I became a, after about a year and a half of washing dishes, I became uh, one of the pizza cooks where I would actually have four different pizza ovens and, and I would literally be the guy that would be, you could hold five different pizzas at once. So you could have a, a maximum of 20 pizzas going at a time. And it was just so fast and stimulating. And uh, I remember yeah. that vividly. And then from there it was, you know, I, I worked there for two years or whatnot. And then I, I went to a Whole Foods. Um, 
And I started working at a seafood counter and I was just the guy that would sling the fish, right? But it was such a cool mm-hmm. grocery store. Um, it was probably like yeah. 2000, 2005 ish or something. Um, and I remember like, you know, just, just the, the attention to detail in the grocery store um, was inspiring with all the products and the fish and learning all these things. And I learned how to break down halibut and cut salmon. They were, we were doing a lot of whole fish butchery in the department at the time. And uh, so anything that kind of correlated with food, my, my jobs are always around food. And then I, one day I was at Whole Foods and I was working at the, the fish counter and this chef walks up in his like coat like, from some country club or whatever. And I said, hey, how do you, yeah. how do you, become, a, how do you become a chef? What is that? And he's like, oh, I went to culinary school. So, you know, I went home and I'm like, mom, I'm going to go to culinary school. And, and she took out a, a $45,000 loan on her townhouse to put me in culinary school. And uh, I'll never wow. forget that. Um, yeah, she put a, a loan against her, her own mortgage to, to give me a, a pass. And, uh, you wow. know, uh, I'm forever uh, grateful for that because I didn't know what the hell I was getting myself into as a dropout. I didn't understand the industry or anything about it. I just thought, like, yeah, I'll, I'll be a chef. There's my direction. I yeah. love food. I love this shit. And uh, I love kitchens. And then I went to work in my first professional kitchen after. And it was just like a, like a, like a, like a welcome, welcome to the industry. You know, it was just yeah. such a, uh, <laughs> such a different uh, experience than I ever would have expected. But, you know, um, that was kind of my path and how I got started in, in doing what I'm doing today. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's really, that's a really cool story. I didn't, I didn't know that about you, of how you yeah. got started. So that's really, that's really interesting. It's really cool that your mom was able to do that for you and kind of get you started yeah. there. You know, that's amazing. It, 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 where did really, you go to culinary school? I went to uh, Le Cordon Bleu in Chicago, uh, Chic. Okay. It was called Chic back then. I graduated in 2005. Yeah, okay. 2005 when I graduated. So, um, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty a lot. It feels like a forever ago. It's, it's, you know, 15 years ago when I got out of culinary school and started like a professional career as a, right. uh, you know, professional yeah. chef. And it's, it's a, I've always been in food service and in restaurants, working in, in those kinds of jobs. Um, but that was kind of how I started really my path of like, I'm going to become a chef and I want to get my own restaurant. I want to, you know, start painting that whole, uh, that whole picture. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I remember seeing, cause I, I grew up in Michigan, like right across the lake pretty much from Chicago. And so I remember seeing all the commercials for the Cordon blue and everything. And I remember I did want to be a chef when I was younger and, but I didn't really know about culinary schools that much. And the only thing I really knew was the Cordon blue. So unfortunately I got away from it and I went to culinary school like much later, but yeah, yeah. it was kind of, uh, Kind of one of those things, but you know. Yeah, I, I, th- I feel like culinary school is great for a lot of kids, and I think that it's, it's if you've got the means and you have the ability to go. But I would always, I yeah. would recommend, you know, like especially today, because now people see chefs in such a different light, and they're, you know, they're, they're yeah, glorified, sure. and there's all the TV shows and all these. It's a great career. I would say go work in the kitchen for at least a year. You know, go to a professional kitchen and, and try to get a job and really push before you before you really make that that jump of spending the money and, and the resources going into culinary school because it's. I think it's once you realize, once you learn about all the directions you can go in the industry and the career, it's really important that, that there's a realistic understanding of what to expect when you get out of culinary school. You know, I remember, I remember thinking literally I was going to leave culinary school and be a chef and have a salary right. and all this shit. And my first job, it was a professional, uh, first professional kitchen was nine fifty an hour. And I remember like, uh, okay. And I, I'd get there at, <laughs> at fucking 10 in the morning, but I wouldn't get, I wasn't able to punch until three and I wasn't leaving till one. And like, you know, it's, but that was, yeah. uh, you know, that was how it was. And, uh, you know, thank you. Uh, times have changed a lot since then, but you know, it was, yeah. it was definitely a, a crazy, crazy wake up call to get into the industry and see and, and, and then realize. But. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A lot of people who just go to culinary school and they come out and they have this grand idea of what being a chef is or just even what being a cook is line cook. And it's right. It's much different once you get in there and not what you see exactly. TV and everything. So, Right. But so obviously we're fast forward a little bit and you have Belmore now, you know, how did, how did Belmore happen? So Belmore was, uh, you know, it was honestly, I, I did Bohemian house before and, and, you know, I left, I was, I was at Bohemian house for about two and a half years, uh, two years, maybe it was really off to uh, a great, great start. I mean, the restaurant was, was financially successful year one. It was uh, at great acclaim. People really, I really kind of cut my teeth there and, uh, it, was a, mm-hmm. it was a great, great restaurant. And after two and a half years, two years of it, I was, I was looking to grow. And I, I was really at a point where I had a young family that just started. Um, you know, we had our second, 
our second child it, when I was doing the restaurant and, and, you know, my family was growing and I needed to grow too. And that was kind of where I was at. Yeah. And with, at the time working with the ownership, uh, there wasn't room in the cards for me. They, you know, they were saying, you know, Hey, listen, we're, we're really happy. The restaurant's doing great. You know, you're great. And thank you. But right now, maybe in a couple of years we could, or you, you know, we'll talk again. I was like, well, that kind of fucking blows. You know, you're sitting there yeah. grinding, grinding your face to the stone. And it was, you know, crazy, crazy hours crazy meal periods restaurants doing great and it was me and a sous chef uh, running it so you know i would i'd wake up in the morning go do brunch and then do saturday service and go home and crash and get back for sunday morning brunch and we had lunch yeah. so, you know it's 14 meal periods a week for that little restaurant and uh wow. you know i got to that point it was time for me to move on and uh yeah i i knew it in my soul and i knew that i wasn't going to be growing with them so I, I had to make that decision and and uh and jump and and i did and it was probably one of the most uh bottomed out times in my life you know i felt uh just completely lost. I made this decision. I don't have a job anymore. I'm, I'm up in the air. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And uh, yeah. when when I when the news broke that I left the restaurant, uh, Lee Wolin contacted me. And uh, oh. you know, I I had met Lee actually through Bohemian House. He came in and ate one time, and uh, he was enamored. Like he loved it. He was blown away by the food. And he we kind of connected on on Instagram, you know, through him coming in to eat in like 2014 or 2015 or whatever the hell it was. And, mm -hmm. uh, we hit it off really quick. You know, it was kind of like, you know, just kind of like buddies going back and forth and talking about food. And I, I remember I went to Boca one night and ate there and I was blown away by what the hell he was doing. And, uh, yeah. we kind of started like a, a, like, like a really organic friendship. And it was, uh, we're, we're polar cool. opposites as people, you know, it's like <laughs> sun and moon and we're two completely different guys, but, um, you know, he's a very straight forward, kind of a dry sense of humor kind of guy. And I'm big jovial over the top. So it was kind of like mm -hmm. this, uh, Frick and frack kind of relationship, and uh, yeah, when I'm when so I crack. left, yeah, when I when I left Bohemian House, you know, uh, I'll I'll never forget Kevin Bame saying this that Lee Wolin would throw around uh, compliments like manhole covers. So when he said that this guy at Bohemian House can really cook, we knew that we knew that it was you know that this guy could really cook. Um, yeah. So so when I left and Lee's like, yo, what are you gonna do? I said, I don't know, dude. Maybe I'll go sell steak or do some something. Who knows what the hell? I don't know if this is gonna if this whole chef dream is going to work out for me. And uh, he's like, yo, just, just call. I'll, I'll put in a word. I'll talk to Kevin and Rob, reach out to him. Here's his, here's his email address. So I figured, you know what, what, what would it hurt to reach, send an email? So I sent a, you know, right. left, yeah. field, le left field email to Kevin. And, and I said, Hey man, you know, my name's Jimmy, blah, blah, blah. I, you know, it's part of Bohemian house. And, and uh, you know, Kevin being very dialed in with Chicago and the food community of, yeah. of our city, not even just on a, on a national level too. Uh, he responded right away and he's like, Hey, well, let's, let's, let's sit down. Let's, let's talk. Um, which was great. And, you know, now, yeah. now these guys, Kevin and Rob meet with tons of chefs all the time. They've met with, you know, yeah. they'll tell you they've done tastings with hundreds of chefs and, and all these things. So, so I remember going to their office for the first time and, uh, we go up these stairs to Bob Momotaro and it's, you walk in and you see like the BRG on the floor and you see all these like, you know, chef posters on the wall with like Stephanie Izard and Paul Veron, yeah. all their other chefs in their office. And I remember feeling like I was like a like a pop artist in a fucking like a like a pop artist in like a major record label studio, right? Yeah. Like meeting with these two guys. Seeing the so record, I, gold records on the wall and stuff. Right, right, right. And the, the doors open up and there's this long ass table and Kevin and Rob are there. And I remember sitting down in front of them and they, they both just started firing off questions like gun turrets, like burr, 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 like asking me financial questions. And who are you? What, what, what do you want to do? And all these things. And after about 10 minutes, I'll, Kevin looked over. Rob goes, you know, I like him. Let's, let's do a tasting. You put together your greatest hits. And uh, at the time, I was like, well, greatest hits. I mean, I've been so versatile throughout my entire career. I didn't really have a greatest hit. I didn't have anything yeah. that was like, yeah, here's my dishes. Here's this and here's that. So for me, cooking has always been just viscera. And then just with whatever job I was in, I would, I would fit the mold and figure out how to make that work in that environment. And that was, uh, that was it. So, so when I got this opportunity to tasting for him, I thought to myself like, well, what are you going to serve two of the biggest restaurateurs in the country that have uh, pretty much seen probably every hot trend and everything and every, and how are you going to make yeah. a, make a mark? How are you going to make a mark? Right. And, and yeah. so when I started contemplating, well, I started thinking about, you know, what do I want to serve? I want to serve them something grand. I want to serve them, you know, oysters and caviar. And I was trying to think of like a very celebratory dish. And I was re originally thinking about Thomas Keller and the story of oyster and pearl. And, you know, his combination, how he's walked to the grocery store and he saw tapioca and he thought of oysters and pearl and the custard. And it just kind of started clicking to me. Like, I want to do mm -hmm. caviar service for them in a bite that strips away all formality. 
um, and it's fun. It's something you pick up with your finger and eat it, it like a quiche. Yeah. And my mind, my mind started going with a quiche. And I was thinking like, if I was to make a custard that was flavored like oyster, cook oysters into the custard, blend them in, set them in a beautiful savory tart shell, top with a layer. Yeah. And I started, then the, my artistic side started coming in and I was drawing and I was trying to figure out how this would, how this would be delivered. And I was thinking about all the, the components of traditional caviar service being in the package of the bite. And that's kind of where the oyster pie uh, came from. So that was kind of okay. the start of it for me. And that's, that was the, uh, the very first dish that I put down in front of them was that dish. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. I remember walking out to the tasting and uh, Kevin was there and uh, Lee Wolin actually sat down at the tasting and, and uh, Kevin and Rob and Lee. And as I was walking out with the oyster pie uh, in my hands, I remember overhearing Kevin say something like, usually chefs try to go a little above and beyond or get out of their comfort zone or something. Yeah. And I remember I, he I heard him say that and I was walking out with, with an ounce of caviar and a piece of quiche. I'm thinking to myself like, oh fuck, did I blow this before it even started? Like, you know, by go going, going way too grand. And, and I remember dropping yeah. it, explaining it, going back to the kitchen. And then when I returned with the second course, they were both very, um, you, know, you could see you had their attention and I could see that they were very uh, intrigued by what was next. And, and that was kind of the, the start of the dish and the start of Belmore at the time. Um, you know, after that tasting, um, we sat down and, you know, Kevin and Rob both were like, this is in the top three tastings we've ever experienced. And you seem like an amazing wow. human. And you're, you're, you know, we, he's like, you know, we do tastings with hundreds of chefs, but this is definitely up there and we, we want to find a spot for you. And that was kind of the, uh, the start of Belmore. So that was, you know, from my lowest wow. time in my, in my career from leaving Bohemian house, the door was opened by one human. And from there, you know, with that opportunity, I, I had to go in and just put myself into something that I've never done before in the most uncomfortable situation ever and, and figure it the fuck out. And I think that that's kind of what, how I, how I live my life as a chef and how I look at everything in life is, is there's a lot of uh, comfortability in being uncomfortable and finding ways to make yourself uh, rise to challenges and occasions. And when you get opportunities, you have to really, uh, you know, apply everything that you've experienced through your life and your career to making that opportunity matter. So. Yeah, that's really awesome. Like I, I kind of heard that story before, a, a much watered down version of like how you kind of got started with Boca and everything. I knew a tasting involved and all that, but I mean, I had a question later of like how how did you come up with the oyster pie that you just kind of explained, which is great. Yeah, I had seen I had seen the oyster pie on Instagram and everything, and I was like, that looks so good. And I, I love oysters Thank and you. caviar and all that, and I was like, I gotta try this. So of course, when we went, I was like, yes, I need this oyster pie, and it was it like. Was it was so like, I don't want to say it was like strange, but like I've never had oysters like that with, they had like the yeah. apple on there and everything just worked about it. But it's just weird because you're eating pie and it's like, yeah, right. it, it was, it, it was really good. Yeah. It was a quiche. You know, I thought of it like, okay, it's a quiche, it's a pie, it's an oyster, it's caviar. And it, it kind of just, you know, and I think that as we opened with that dish and it became like the, the poster child for the restaurant and with the size yeah. of Belmore and all the volume and the attract uh, the traction that it got being a, you know, associated with Boca. And, and uh, it was, it was a, it became kind of like a, that dish, you know, like that, that internet, dish, like, Oh, was it made for Instagram? Like, no, it wasn't made for, for Instagram, but uh, you know, it was right. uh, someone says we basically went to Belmore for the oyster pie. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of people that did. And that was my fiance. That's what that we went there. And I, cause I was like, oh. I have to try the oyster pie. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, so yeah, it was a very, uh, finesse based manicured dish with it was very temperamental challenging to execute I believe um, and then the and then you think about it too the uh, the price point of it you know people would have a hard time coughing up 65 70 bucks for an ounce of caviar not even understanding that that isn't what you get one ounce of caviar at most places so it was uh right. it was kind of like uh you know the journeys don't stop believing for the restaurant you know it was like a yeah. hit and you get tired of playing it and it just didn't really correlate anymore and you know, things went yeah. on, but I mean, it was a, it was a one hell of a, I actually love it. Amazing bite. And, and I hope you took it again. And it's really good. So, uh, Gerald Taylor wants to know about when opening your restaurant, what do you think was the most important decision? I, I can tell you uh, wholeheartedly that talent and creative ideas and all that stuff are, it's amazing. It's great to think of the oyster pie and it's great to think of all these things and be creative. But if you're, if your business and your restaurant, yeah, people kind of always forget uh, about the business and the metrics of a restaurant being sustainable without making money, without making sure that, that, that the investors can get, you know, get money back and that the restaurant's paying itself off. 
without having a, a healthy business, you, you're not going to be open long. So it's really yeah. important. I think one of the most important things that uh, most people overlook uh, is really understanding metrics and understanding how to make a restaurant successful. And it's, it's not easy. It's extremely, extremely hard. Um, there's so yeah. many factors that can go into a restaurant not working. Um, and I think above all, just being a great cook and just being talented and just having the best design isn't enough. You've got to be You've got to be, you know, business minded from the from the get and really kind of be thinking about that. And I'm speaking from experience and I'm thinking, you know, also speaking from a sense of, you know, as I as I grow in my life and, and, and career continues to roll, you have to make the right decisions uh, with finance and business in mind. And they, they, it's, it's just like a vinaigrette, right? If you have too much acid or too much salt, your salad's going to taste awful. So you really yeah. have to balance that vinaigrette and pitch it right. And the business is, is the same exact thing, just on a completely different uh, scope and scale. And there's a lot of things that just, you can't control. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, I've, I've been kind of flirting with the idea of wanting to open my own place for like a long time. And I just, I get overwhelmed when I sit down and really think about it. It's just so yeah. many things. I do the research. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh my God. So, uh, and then you start to think great. like, when you look at the bottom line, you think to yourself like, why the hell would anyone want to do this for a right. living? Right. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's maniacally uh, chaotic, but, uh, you know, you fall in love yeah. with it. And, and then your love for the, the industry and your love for great experiences. You know, when you, when you go to an amazing restaurant, it blows you away. That yeah. magic is something as a diner that a diner feels like it's like a, it's like a magic show. Like, how the hell did that happen? And it's so amazing when you right. experience it, that those kinds of experiences are things that you might cling to throughout your, throughout your career and kind of be your driving force. It's create that magic and, and feel that energy. And it's, it's a really special thing because it's not something you can just buy and have. It's something that you have right. to cultivate every single day across. It, it, it's like a sports team. You know, it's like being a quarterback isn't enough. You need to have a great yeah. coach. You need to have a great tight end. You need to have the whole pack, the whole package to make that team amazing. And that's, that's, that's that team effort that really makes things feel right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's funny too. When you talk about like good and bad experiences at a restaurant, like usually with a bad experience, you know, specifically what it was, whether it was like your server, right. the food, like whatever it may be. But like with a good experience, you just like, it was just everything, you know, from when yeah. you walk in to when you thing. left, it was just like the whole thing right. was just such a magical experience. And yep. of course you can find specifics, but it's just like, it's everything. So exactly. And I, I mean, I miss it so much. My wife and I went to a place uh, not too long ago, we went to a sushi place in Downers Grove and downtown Downers, but it, we sat outside. It was like 40 degrees outside. We're freezing. We're in jackets underneath eating sushi for lunch and miso soup and stuff. But it was That's so nice so to just feel normal and like to be like, yeah. we're saying like, even though underneath all this shit, like just, we miss, you miss restaurants. I mean, there's such, yeah. such special businesses, you know, they're, they're not, it's not like it's a, you know, an auto store. It's a freaking warehouse where you're just stocking shelves with miscellaneous inventory. It's, it's a really special business. And I think that's what a lot of the allure and attraction is. It's such a gratifying feeling to be a part of, to experience to let alone be the one who's giving that experience to others. And that's, that's kind of yeah. what I, why I connect with it so much. Yeah, definitely. And it's that hospitality aspect of just bringing everyone together. Cause we all have great, you know, memories of dinners around a big dinner table with a bunch of people, whether it was friends or family or, you know, whatever it is. And yeah. you always have, everyone's got at least one of those memories that's right. You know, that they cherish cause it was just good food and good company, you know? So, yep. Exactly. And unfortunately, you know, like you said, with the pandemic and, you know, we just want to feel normal again. And fortunately, restaurants have gotten felt like really gotten the short end of the stick. A lot of people have, but like restaurants seem to be like the very, very short end of that stick. Um, and there have been, I think, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of, of there's a lot of collateral. There's a lot of things in the air that we can't control. And it's so tough to yeah. be in that position uh, as an industry and to be hit so hard. And it literally, I mean, there's been times throughout this this process uh you know i've woke up feeling like complete shit because of it like you know like what did yeah. i do wrong and what's the problem and, and you you kind of have to just you know you feel like there's no place for you anymore there's no no purpose for your work and what you what you believe yeah. in so much and uh it's a really uh, deflating feeling to go through it but you know you kind of have to just realize that there's bigger things that at play here and, and everything that that is supposed to happen can and will and, and we're just kind of in this this together and you know hopefully you know, and hopefully things change this year and hopefully we get to a point where the cases yeah. start dropping and people are comfortable uh, going out and, you know, and, and moving forward with life because uh, I think everyone in this world uh, can, can agree that that's something we all want. 
Yes, I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what are your feelings towards how, like, you know, Mayor Lightfoot or even Governor Pritzker, how they've handled the pandemic for Chicago and Illinois? I think it's tough to say. I mean, uh, uh, listen, being a politician of any sort where you have the power to make those decisions, that's, you know, that, that, that thing, heavy lies the crown. You know, it's, it's a very uh, tough position to be in because you're the one that's making these, these decisions. And, you know, obviously with, with advisors and all the other crap that goes into it that, that most of the GP isn't privy to, um, making those decisions is tough. <laughs> it's not easy to be the one that has to make those decisions. But, right. you know, I, I can understand reasons why they want to close things down, um, you know, with all the cases that have popped up and everything. And I understand that the purpose of that. But I could also say that I being at Belmore during the reopening and, and seeing how focused the company was on, on safety and health and tracing back to restaurants where COVID cases are coming from. It's such a uh, it's such a difficult thing to say that it's this restaurant or it's that where, where, where did you contract COVID at? It, it, it could be a bunch of places. I know that yeah. we, as a company, Boca worked so hard to, to really make sure that the, every one of their operations was, 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 was above the benchmark. And we did, you know, I mean, we bought the, the fricking $4,000 sanitizing gun and, you know, we limited know, know. the <laughs> amount of people inside and, and it was just, you know, doing all that um, as much as you can under those restrictions, just, it's, just too taxing on the business at, at a certain point either you know it, it's the, the business is already challenging enough as it is so so to circle back to the question how do i feel about it i think that for me to say how i feel about uh, their decision it, it's almost immaterial you know i think that the, the safety of human life is, is always a priority um and i also do feel that you know everyone's got different uh different severities towards towards the the, the virus and, and some people have compromised immune and they'd have to be very careful and that's totally understandable and respectable. And I think that there's other people that, that they are, that I don't care if I get it, I'll go out and sit in a restaurant and eat. And I think that, you know, closing down economies, uh, depending on, on how much life is being lost, what makes sense, you know, and looking at numbers is you, you can't hide from numbers. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely tough. I mean, you can agree or disagree, but unless, you know, you're the one seeing all the things happen and I can't even imagine what it's like to be a governor or a politician. At uh, yeah. All. I, it's too big for me. <laughs> I get nervous. Yeah, I agree. I, I would want to be, I don't need that I much responsibility or have that many people relying right. on me for their livelihood. Oh. I, I can, I My wife and I, I, I get nervous when she tells me, what are we eating for dinner tonight? You know, like that to me is a big decision. So let alone like <laughs> trying to make funny. really big decisions. Like, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's tough. I mean, you can say, I feel like for the most part, as far as Illinois is concerned, we've done a decent job here and there uh unfortunately I, I feel like restaurants have gotten uh a raw deal with it considering a lot of other businesses have been allowed to stay open while restaurants have had to close but agreed hopefully yeah. we're, hopefully we're gonna see some improvements i know we are i just read today that we're back to like a decent level of cases or at least it's not spiking anymore it's gone down so hopefully yeah yeah, I think we'll as we come out with vac as the vaccine becomes more readily available and more people get vaccinated and, and you know, it's going to take a while for, for, for people to feel comfortable going out. It's just inevitable. Everyone's yeah, got different levels true. and it, it's hard to say, like, I can't say my level of comfortability is yours. And then what you'd like to right. be doing so for, for me, it's going to be tough for people to, to get to that level of comfortability where businesses can start opening again, focusing on, on forward motion. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll just kind of, you know, it's been a year. So if you look at it like that, we're almost at a year and it's like, yeah, you, you know, I've heard the saying, you can do anything for a year. And uh, after your first year, you can do anything for another year. It's like that kind of, you yeah. know, as things come in, we just take it and, and you know, you got to stay resilient in life and get, get used to being, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I mean, I, I mean, I can't really say much. I was in the Navy or, you know, I didn't see any like actual action or I was, didn't have boots on crown or anything, but that's, just being on a ship, for instance, and uh, my friend Gerald, who's watching, can attest to that. He's still in. But, yeah, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's a yep. lesson that any service in the military will teach you for sure. Right. But, um, so circling back to kind of how you run your restaurants and everything, uh, I've noticed lately, and I'm sure you have too, there's been a big movement with the whole, like, yes, chef culture of, you know, there's plenty of places where as long as if the chef says something, it's yes, chef and you go to any lengths to make sure it happens, even if it's sometimes unsafe. Um, Chef Ryan Pfeiffer from now Big Kids had posted this. He said, the only way to rid ourselves of the toxic chef culture is to remove the chef 
from the equation. Be a leader, not a tyrant. Be a person, not a chef. Lead by example. Put yourself in the background. Lift up your staff. Uh, I, I mean, do you agree with that? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, Ryan's awesome. I love Ryan, um, and I, I could also agree with the fact that you know, Belmore was definitely yes chef. Like we did a lot of chef. Everybody was yes chef, no chef. But there was a lot of just the way that we communicate to, to, to very, very quickly understand that we've got it. There's also a level of professionalism that we ran the kitchen with. Um, it doesn't make us any better, any stronger, any more macho or cooler, or more of like a, a legit restaurant. But it was just a part of the yeah. culture that we, we set in the restaurant. But, you know, I think uh, another big thing, too, is also to be a human. I mean, that's the most yeah. important thing. You know, I mean, I've worked for assholes. I've been a part of that. And, and I've always kind of... Uh, never wanted to be that way. And I think I could say for most people that I've worked with, um, you know, it was, Oh, I work for you. No, you don't work for me. You're with me. We work together. Yeah. We're here in this restaurant. Like this isn't, it might be, yeah, Belmore was for Jimmy and it's Jimmy's restaurant. Blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the concerted effort of these humans is what make it come to life. And I've always kind of approached uh, people that I work with, with that, you know, just because I'm the chef doesn't mean you need to tell me yes all the time. It's, it's refreshing when people actually might, might throw something at you and make you think differently than your own egotistical mind would, would make things work. So, so yeah. for me, I, I mean, the whole yes chef thing, I think it all parlays back to the style of restaurant, the style of kitchen. And I don't eschew, you know, working in those kinds of environments where it's very, very disciplined and very focused and intense. But I think there's a very fine line between being focused, intense, and, and really caring about your work, and then just being an mm -hmm. asshole. You know, there's, there, there, there's, there's, there's no reason to berate people and, and, you know, people fuck up. I fuck up every day. Everyone makes mistakes. And, and I understand when, yeah. when, when stakes are high and you've got a reputation and there's a lot of things riding on it, 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 it can make people go off really quick. Right. Um, yeah. but I've always just tried to be a good human and treat people the way that I'd want to be treated. And given that the, I try to give people the opportunity to, to do their best work that's really the sum yeah. of being a leader. It's like your job is to, is, is not to be in control and put people under your thumb. Your job is to, to have a mission, have an idea of the direction and get the, mm -hmm. the cohort, they get to get the, the entire team to be in the same mindset. Um, and, and with that, uh, you know, you get a lot more, a lot more bees with uh, honey than vinegar or whatever the, however the saying goes, but right. it, it, it's, it's true. It's like, I mean, like I like to have fun and anybody that's worked with me will tell you that I'm goofy. I like to sing. I'm, I also can get very intense and very serious when the time's needed. Um, but then yeah. again, I'm, I'm also just like, like I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm just a dude cooking food. So, you yeah. know, when you put all, all the bullshit and all the ego aside, like you're just, we're just cooking food for people. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I guess it doesn't matter if you're spending you know, thousands of dollars on the meal or, you know, five bucks. It's, yeah. you know, still, still food at the and end of the day. Right. But then again, when you are going to a place like Bennu and you're going to spend $1,200 for you and your wife to eat a dinner there, there's an expectation, right? It's like when you buy, when you pop the money to buy a Mercedes, you expect all the bells and whistles and you expect the, the luxury yeah. brand. And, it, and it, so, so to do that and pull it off, I understand the dedication that it takes. I understand the amount of focus and the amount of intensity that the team needs to have to execute yeah. at a, a very high level. And it's not easy. And that's why there's a lot of stress and a lot of pressure in those positions. So I, I, I can understand why, yes, yes chef culture uh, is an extremely toxic one as well. Um, I just think it's, right. more, it's more about balancing that and finding the, you know, just back to the vinaigrette uh, theory earlier, it's about balancing right. the two Balance, and, and still right. treating everybody as a human is, is a non-negotiable. Like there's no, you know, nothing from a dishwasher, you know, I've always, you know, said I treat the dishwasher the same as I treat, treat the guy who owns the fucking place, you know, you treat them right. like humans. And I, I like, I connect with people when I see them. Hey, how are you? How's it going? You remember things about people. And, and for me, that, yeah. you know, that connection with people is what's always kind of fueled my love for the industry and my love for working. And, you know, I don't know about you, but when I go into work, I like to feel like a family with the people I'm with. I like to feel like, you know, I spend more time with these people than I do with my own family. So for me, it's like, you know, th yeah. there's a sense of, of trying to build that continually there. Yeah, absolutely. I know when I when I did stage at, at Belmore, like you're probably one of the only chefs that's ever like come up to me multiple times to like to see how things were going. Most of the time it's like yeah. you might get the introduction in the beginning and then just kind of like pushed away. But like you actually like came back like multiple times to see how I was doing and asked me questions all and stuff. So it was great. You know, because it's like I, I've always thought about this. Like when I was a young cook and I would stage in places and I, I staged, you know, in a couple of different great restaurants in Chicago that had great res, you know really, really, you know, places that were looked up to at the time and they were, you know, pinnacles and all that shit. And I'd go work there and I'd feel like, 
you're a fucking piece of shit in their kitchen. And I started realizing like, right. I don't ever want people to feel like that if I ever got the opportunity to run a restaurant. I don't want people to yeah. come into my kitchen and feel like shit. I want them to come in yeah. and feel like we're a family, we take care of each other, we have fun, we work hard, we bust our ass towards the goal. But, but at the end of the day, I, I want everyone to, to feel good. I feel like you're only gonna do great work if you're in, in a, place of, a place of good, good sound mind. You know, the, the yeah, job's absolutely. hard enough as it is. It, there, there's so much time restrictions and pressures that you have just to get your station set up. And, and that's intense on its own. So you need the intensity, but you also need the ability to just connect with people as people. And, and that, that's nothing more than just taking the second to ask someone, hey, how are you? Is everything good? Everyone's being cool. We're good. No one's yelling at you. Like, yeah. I, I, love, I love making sure that people feel, feel, feel that when they come into a restaurant that I, I happen to be uh, running or, or working in or, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's a great man mentality to have for whether you're at the top or in the middle or wherever you're at, you know. And yep. that's what, when I first started, when I first got into, like, management, or being put in a leadership position like that was always my go-to of like I want to make sure everyone feels comfortable with me and I'm leading by example and I have to remember that I started out at the bottom as well right and you know you struggle getting to the top and everyone's gonna like you said everyone's gonna make mistakes everyone's gonna have the slip ups and you know obviously in the moment you know if you're in the middle of service and you have like only four orders left to some and then somebody drops that pan it's just like yeah. yeah you oh, yeah. Tell me out of there, but it's. Yeah. I mean, there's been there's been crazy story. I mean, I've had stories with people that that have acted out of line in the kitchen, and I've let them go right there on the spot, you know. And it's just, yeah. uh, you know, they they I you know I don't talk to people like that. You're not going to talk to people like that. You know, see you later. Right. It's just kind of, it's just the way that I I feel. You know, I, I feel that we we look at things that we learn because if we learn like this is how it's supposed to be. People read about Marco Pierre White in the old times. And they think that like this, this chef culture and this big macho ness, and and yeah, I, I think that's what makes each human being so unique is that their own DNA and own fingerprint of who they are and their management style as people will be very indicative of how they run their restaurants and how they run their businesses. Whether you're, you, you know, you let's say you, you're, let's say you stock breaks for a warehouse or something, you could run that place like shit and be an asshole to people. Or you could be a team, yeah. team focused person who gets your crew together, makes everybody feel a part of something, but also make sure that everyone understands the mission and what we're trying to accomplish as a team for the for the results of the business. And that's the that's that 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 give and take that you have to have. You can't be too soft where you get walked all over and you can't get work done. And you, you also can't be too far on the other end where no one's gonna want to work with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean everything in restaurants, like I said, it's a balancing act. It's uh making sure like all the food is, you know, being Everything just has to be well balanced because in a restaurant, just the slightest tip in any direction can throw the whole operation off course. Agreed. So it's, a, it's such an interesting industry to work in if you've it's one you know, hell, it's, hell, 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 hell. It's, it's hard to explain to people. Well, you yeah, know, I, I think people don't really realize the, the amount of work that goes in and how much effort it takes to put a meal together. And yeah. for someone just to eat it in their two hour window of being in your restaurant and it's gone and it's on to the next one. And, and that energy is, it's such a perishable business. And I've said this, it's every single thing about restaurants is perishable. The product, the energy, the yeah. people, the staff, it's, it's a highly perishable business with shit margins, uh, an immense amount of frustrations. But at the end of the day, yeah. that feeling of like a, of a great service or giving somebody an amazing experience is what fuels that, that repetitious addictive cycle of restaurant yeah. work and living and it's it's just kind of you, you either you're either captivated by it when you're first ex exposed to it or you go the other way and you say that is totally not for me but then yeah. you throw you throw a guy like me into an office and give him a computer and say you're going to be here eight hours a day i'd probably be like what the fuck is this like I, it doesn't <laughs> doesn't work for me so yeah uh, you know. uh, yeah definitely so circling back to to balance of restaurants and everything but obviously with doing the work we do, we have to have a good balance of like your personal life and your professional life. With having a wife and three kids, you know, how, how do you maintain that balance when you are working like full time in a restaurant? So whenever I've, I've done like from Bohemian House into Belmore, there, there's such a large emotional investment that goes into your restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a personal one. It, it consumes your brain. Uh, you don't sleep well at night. You wake up in the morning unrested, even though you were in bed for nine hours. Yeah. Your mind is constantly focused on the, the, the restaurant. And especially when you open the restaurant that first year, it's like having a newborn baby, except times 10, 
because your, your focus, yeah. and your energy, and you put so much passion into inspiring people and so much energy into the business and, and making sure you're doing the right things. And, and you, you forget about yourself a lot. And it's happened to me a number of times um, in doing this. And, and there's a point where you start to put way too much of yourself into things and things start falling apart because you're, you're just not at your best performance because you're, 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 you're shot. You know, you're trying yeah. to do everything. Um, you're trying to, to keep everything moving. And then there's the worry and fear and the pressure of being the guy that's, that's the chef and you, it's on you to make this thing successful. And yeah. uh, so it, it, it's a, a very challenging job to have a family in. It's a very challenging job to have anything else in because your energies uh, that you put in are so vast. And so, mm -hmm. so, so I would get home from work and I'm, I'm fucking spent. You know what I mean? Like you, you serve 250 people and you're, you're operating at a high level and you're, you've, you've been there all morning and, you, and you're on your day number, you know, you open the restaurant. I mean, the first, I worked 68 days straight and with the exception of uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas day when we opened Belmar yeah. and it was just that grind of just like being there, it wears you to the bone and you get, you yeah. know, you, it's, it's very easy to get lost in that. So the, the, the number one thing that I've learned throughout the process is to, um, put a lot of yourself into it, care a lot, do what you have to do. And, and, and hopefully the people around you, you've hired good people and they're able to help keep that burden less lessened. Yeah. Um, which isn't always the case because, you know, turnover is insanely high in the industry and people come and go very quick and you're constantly in that, that undertow. But I've learned that, you know, trusting the people around you and, and making sure that you've hopefully done your job to be, to give the right direction and, and help paint the right picture for, for what things need to be. You know, that, that's the, the key to having that work-life balance. Does it always happen? No. <laughs> you know, it, it's right. the key and it's something you work for as a chef and you really push for. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to get there. It's, it's just because that specialness of the restaurant requires an immense amount of self, you know, and everybody yeah. around it. You know, most people that are, that are going to work with talented, uh, passionate folks expect that person to be there 24 fucking seven. They expect yeah. you to be the one there teaching them how to brunoise and how to do all these tasks and teaching them all this stuff and inspiring them. But a lot of people forget that your own inspiration has to come from within. I can't teach. I, I might be able to show you a recipe. I might be able to talk to you about ideologies and think about food and challenge the way you think, but it's up yeah. to you to bring your A game. That's not right. me. I'm not, I'm not the one that's going to make you a better cook. You're going to make right. yourself a better cook, not me. Absolutely. And that's the one thing that I feel that it's so jaded. You think like, Oh, I'm working for this amazing chef and it's going to mean I'm going to be the best no, it's not. It's what are you taking from that experience? What are you, how yeah. are you applying yourself to learn and grow in that, in that, and how are you bettering things? I think that's another thing everyone expects, like, what are you giving me? What am I going to get out of it? But if you right. go into things with the mentality of I'm here to be a part of something and, 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 and solve problems, because there's fucking problems everywhere. I can't tell you mm -hmm. how many people stand around and say, oh, this sucks and this doesn't work and that doesn't work. Well, no shit. Be a part of the fucking solution. You know, one of yeah. the things that I've, I had posted on the wall at Belmore is I put up a bunch of idioms for us. And it's, you know, if you, if you make a mess, clean the mess immediately. The next one is if you see someone cleaning a mess, help them clean the mess. Be a part of, yeah. you know, it's, it's a very, yeah, that, that, that to me is probably one of the, the craziest things about the job is, is realizing that. Is once, once young cooks realize that and once two chefs realize that and they stop looking at it as, you know, uh, you know what's this person going to do for me? That mentality is infectious and it changes the, the whole course for the team. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely, it's funny uh, that someone is just joining us. Uh, Ivan here, uh, I, I got to serve with him in the Navy as well. And he's saying it's, you know, what we're talking about is a lot like the Navy. And I relate my experience yeah. in the Navy to working in kitchens all the time because it's very similar of like that structure and yep. just like working on a ship or whether you're in a unit, like everyone's got to be all in. Yep. And you have to find your own passion because your officers yep. or whoever can give you orders. But like, unless you truly yeah. believe that, like, you know, yeah. you're not going to care. And so it's kind of. Exactly. I feel like that was one of my, the easier transitions of going from like being a cook in the Navy or just being in the Navy to like just going back to kitchens. And it was just a really easy transition because I was, you know, I was already doing it basically. Yeah. But, it's, it's, they're very similar. I mean, there's that, there's that level of intensity and focus. And like I said earlier, it's a unit, not, not one man. I don't care how, freaking talented you are and you can you might be able to come up with the craziest dishes and all this shit but yeah. you know if you can't execute and you don't have a team to execute it doesn't matter yeah right absolutely 100 percent agree so we're at the end of our 
kind of no garnish questions. This last one I have to ask you because I ask everyone who's on the show this question. But as a chef, what is your tool you most rely on in the kitchen, but you can't say your knife? Can it be like, uh, I don't know if an attitude is a tool, but your state of mind is, is definitely a tool to your work. You know, and I think that yeah. that is, I don't know if that's cliche, if other people have said that. Um, if it's no a one physical said that. Tool, well, okay, that's good. Yeah. The physical tool. Well, we can go with both. Obviously, your attitude is probably the most important tool you bring in the kitchen. But if you had to pick an actual physical kitchen tool, what would that be? Besides <laughs> that? Obviously, I mean, vacuum sealers are amazing. I, I would say uh, I've always thought about Vita Preps is, is one of my favorites. Vi you know, Vita Prep lenders. Yeah. I mean, they could, they could turn a brick to dust. They could emulsify a hollandaise. You can make a vinaigrette in two seconds in them. I yeah. I love I love my Vita Preps. Um, one of my one of my favorite tools for sure is probably a Vita Prep. Um, okay. Yeah. Totally. Gotta have just, a they're, 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 there. Yeah, they're they're but. so versatile, and I, I love them for for a lot of reasons. So I would definitely say probably Vita Prep's my favorite. No, it's kind of lame, but that's my. No, it's not. It's 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 really important. Like it's funny. I have my my friend Addison gives me crap all the time because I at, here at my apartment I have a Ninja Blender because I got it for a gift one year. And it's hard. <laughs> it, it can yeah. chew up a bite. The thing is so strong, and but it's not like the. It has a lot of more like safety features for like a home right. cook. Right. And so it's, it's kind of funny, but it works great. Having a high power blender is just awesome. So it's clutch. You can grind spices. You can do everything in them. So I think yeah, they're, they're probably right. one of my favorite, most versatile tools. For sure. Okay. So before we go, last round of questioning. We are in our lightning round of questions. Okay, right. You got the techno going. It's good stuff. Yeah. Get you pumped. All right. So lightning round. Try to answer as fast as you can. Number one. Actually, wait. I got to back up. I had a question. All right. Number one. I know your kids are kind of, and I think I saw your wife behind you. So I don't know if you want to answer this or not. But when your kids fall down, do you laugh or do you gasp? Laugh. Laugh. Okay. It's, first <laughs> it's the first thing. It's a laugh always. That makes sense. All right. Uh, number two. Uh, best sandwich. Oh, Jesus. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, let's just say a Reuben. Okay, that's a good love, one. Love a good Reuben. Right. Reuben's are good. All right. Uh, what is one thing that you own that you should really throw out? My cell phone. Cell phone. Yeah. Just the whole thing? Off, now you off, don't want to get a new one? Just get rid of the cell oh, phone? Oh, ouch. I think social media is destroying the fucking world and making people live in, in false worlds. Throw the cell phone out. That's fair. I mean, that's going against everything I've been trying to work for right now, but I understand <laughs> it. <laughs> I, yeah, it's it's maybe maybe not the cell phone. Let's say it's a let's double, say, it's a double edged sword. I completely yeah. understand. Like I hate it's it now good. that because I've been doing YouTube and stuff, I'm like even more on my phone, like checking my posts and like trying to do all this stuff. And I like I don't even like it, but I know it's necessary for like trying it, to get it going. But. It's so important in so many ways, but it's also such a toxic world, and, and it's yeah, like. Yeah. Uh, it's so fake and it's so not real and you get out of it and you start to realize, you know, so I, yeah, social media, cell phones, I would say, throw them out. Let's go it back. Sense. Let's go back to having pen pals and stuff where you had to write people yeah. and, you know. Yeah. What's, what's paper? Who writes on paper? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. All right. Uh, what is the scariest animal? A fucking shark. I, I think one of my biggest fears is the ocean because really? of the fact of yeah, that, that fear of not oh, knowing yeah. what's under you. I, I find them I find them extremely like I think that would probably be one of the scariest experiences. Like I'll get anxiety just thinking about getting attacked in the ocean. Like it, that's, that's so funny. Yeah, no dice. I, I hear that all the time. People say it all the time with not wanting to go in the ocean. It's like not even a concern for me. When I'm in there, I'm I know, like everyone says, like, oh, there, there's only six attacks a year. Like, yeah, I don't want to be one of those six. Like, you're in the, <laughs> you're in the shark, you know, environment. Like, that's that's a scary place to be. So for that's me, it's, it's sharks. Yeah. Okay. All right, sharks. All right, uh, apples or oranges? Apples. Yeah, for sure. Have it's, you ever? Oranges are great too. So, yeah, oranges are great, but I definitely I feel like apples are just more versatile. Yeah, I enjoy a good apple. Same. All right. Have you ever asked for someone's autograph? And if so, who? Sinbad. Sinbad. No. -uh. Sinbad. Yeah. Uh -huh. awesome. Yeah. I was. Wow. I was at like uh, like a, a, a hotel in in Holly or Florida. It was like, we were at like one of the MGM Hollywood hotels or something in Florida, and I was probably like twelve years old. I'll never forget. 
that I was waiting at the elevator to go up to my room. And like, my mom let me go to the gift store and I was waiting the doors open up. And like, he was like, you know, I was little, but he's a huge dude. Yeah. He had like this, like tan silk, uh, like, like full blown, like silk robe thing on. And I'm like, I remember saying to him, like, Stay bad. he goes, Hey, what's up, baby? And he gave me like a double guns and like, Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. The coolest. Really, that's a good one. Like I, I talk about Sinbad not all the time, but like, cause he was so funny. The but, like, 90s, man, so house guest, like he was awesome. Uh, yeah. No one knows yeah. like who he is much anymore. And it's like, he's actually from yeah. uh, like Harbor, Michigan, like a town right, right by mine that I grew up that's in. Awesome. So, yeah, yeah. I, I would say it's definitely one of the coolest. Yeah. That's a really good one. All right. Favorite action movie. Ooh. Um, Die Hard's pretty red, but um, you know what? I, I would I would have to say Kill Bill. I think it's just so fun as a volume one and two. Kill Bill as a series yeah. is just such a fun freaking movie, and yeah, you know, just be, Beatrix Kiddo in, in in number two when she goes and, and gets uh, gets trained by Pai Mei, and you you see that whole thing. It's just such a cool uh, cool film, yeah. and I love the whole revenge plot. Like it, it's a great great movie. Yeah, those are those are good. I mean, I think by Quentin Tarantino, it's pretty solid. For yeah, sure. I mean, th that man, my wife and I just watched Re uh, Reservoir Dogs for her first time ever. We started watching it the other night and fell asleep 30 minutes in. And, like, she's asking all these questions, like, well, what's going on? And who's this? I said, this is, like, the, you know how Quentin Tarantino writes his movies where they're, like, mm -hmm. you know, they're, 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 they're just, so amazing. So. Thing to understand yeah. Why. There's, no and one knows exactly what's happening. As and, when he hits you, and when he hits you with the twist, it's, like, you know, it always blows your mind. So, yeah, I definitely yeah. would, I would say, uh, yeah, Kill Bill. That's good. All right. Favorite smell. Ooh, uh, I love the smell of like roasted, roasted hazelnuts and like roasted nuts. I think that always makes me brown butter. That's a good one. Ooh, that is a good yeah. one. Brown butter. Yeah. I think brown, even better though. We used to clarify crab shells, uh, king crab shells in butter. And then that butter was like the most like aromatic, like crab flavored butter that we had poached crab in. And that smell is like, when I was a cook at uh, De La Costa, we used to poach king crab and clarified king crab butter. And that, so that, that flavor memory is something that just reminds me so much of that, that, that time in my cooking career. And, uh, and it's also delicious because I, you know, king crab and butter, so. Right, yeah, can't go wrong with that. Uh, flat or sparkling water? I like sparkles. Sometimes I like yeah. that. Depends on the day, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, I'm, say, I'm definitely- I used to sparkling I, water. If I eat, it's sparkling. Usually, if I'm going to go out to a restaurant and eat like a nice meal, I'll do a sparkling water because I like to kind of just have that effervescent yeah. clearance of my palate. Uh, sure. But but other than that, like all day long, I'm drinking flat water. But yeah, if I'm eating, it's sparkling. That makes sense. I pretty much only drink sparkling water. Like we have a soda stream, so we can like just make carbonated water really quickly. And so I, that's like all I drink now. But okay, yeah. I'm curious about this question because you want to get rid of your phone. But what is your most used app on your phone currently? In Instagram, it's the most used uh, form of any app because I think I pick it up and you get news on it, you get entertainment, you get inspiration that's from true. it, you see what other, you see what the world's doing. It's, uh, I think that's definitely probably one of the most used apps for me. Um, yeah. Is definitely the the gram, the gram, the gram, everything for the gram, everything. For yeah. The gram. <laughs> All right. What is one song that you could listen to for the rest of your life? Um, Jukebox Hero by. Uh, foreigner i think it's pretty rad nice. that's, that's yeah there. yeah it reminds me of like walking into a bowling alley you know right like, just like, like in, the, in the in the 80s like it was right. like, like, low, and like kick the doors open and there's yeah. like, smoke and like lights like that to me is i've actually like kind of yeah. i've kind of done that once we were bowling and like i put that song in the jukebox and it was my turn to bowl and it came on like right at like the first like major guitar lift and I just like lift the ball up and I just yeah. threw it and I got a yeah, so it was it, pretty incredible. <laughs> it, it is like the quintessential bowling alley like hero yeah. thing. So yeah. if I had to like do one thing for the rest of your life, I think just walking, you know, in bell bottoms and like platform shoes and like, yeah, that, that'd be me. Real, real like a uh, Kingpin style, Bill Murray. Yeah, and Cody yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right. What number am I thinking of right now? 28. No, no, no. Damn it. <laughs> All right, last one. This is kind of a toughie. Describe the rest of your life in five words. Unequivocally, unequivocally. Uh, all right, no, it would be, I don't know what that word means, so let's not use that one. Uh, the rest okay. of my life in five words would be 
Uh, magically, unequivocally, irresistibly, uh, fun of all time. That's uh, a lot. I don't know. I, that's a tough one. <laughs> Shit. The rest of my one. life. Yeah, the yeah. rest of my I'm life. Yeah, that's tough. That's okay. You but, did pretty well. And in a I've never never, yeah. Before, so it was the first time answer like that was pretty good. I'll, I'll I'll send you something later tonight. We could we'll re-edit that or something. All right, sounds, yeah, I'll back. Back. sounds good. All right, well that is all the questions I have for you, Chef. I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, it was really fun talking to you more. Uh, you know, maybe we'll get to work together in the future at some point. Who knows? Um, Absolutely. I can't wait for Belmore to open back up so I can go eat there again and have some more oyster pie. Um, thank you. Thank you to all of our listeners and watchers, wherever you're at. I really appreciate it. Uh, Make sure you hit that hit that like button, you share these videos, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Look forward to a new chili paste video coming out this week. And I think that's it. Again, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. And next week I have, I know I kind of, the last show I had, uh, I moved some dates around and my friend Nick from California is going to be joining us next week. So look forward to him. He's a really cool guy. I got to work with him. He's doing some cool stuff out in San Francisco. So we'll look forward to that. So everyone have a great night and chef. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Chefs. Awesome. Good night. Thank you, Alec. Take care. Yeah. Thank you.